Emily Lape, welcome back to Kicking the Seat. I think the last time we talked was was last late last summer, um, right ahead of your um, you were, we we're going to talk about uh, relative, and we talked about Mercy's Girl as well. Um, and now we're back talking about uh, an upcoming film that you're working on called Abacu, or you're about to start. Is that right? I, I want give me the give me the the long and short of where is Abacu. And we're going to talk about the the Seed and Spark campaign, along with a lot of other things tonight, including a review, a group review with my co-host, David Fowley of Keeping It Real. That's you. Yes. Um, of a film that inspired or in some part inspired your uh, your next project, uh, The Vast of Night from 2018, 2019. Um, that's my long rambling introduction. Let's start off with the simple question. How are you doing? I'm doing um, I feel like an insane person right now, but I'm doing good. I'm doing really oh. good. <laughs> How long have you felt this way? You know what? I wish I could say recent, just recently, but probably longer. <laughs> so, it's not a foreign feeling. No. <laughs> not at all. So, Emily, um, uh, Abacu, um, your new picture, is it your start? You're going to be shooting it very soon. Is that correct? Yeah, we're about less than two months away from principal photography. Yeah, yeah, out, out in New Mexico. So, uh, hence why I feel like an insane person. Um, Pre-production is a little rough. <laughs> right. I can imagine it. I I would love to to have you share. You know, as much knowledge as you can. We don't want you telling any stories out of school, but um, you know, we're very interested in all aspects of of film, not just reviewing movies that have come out, but also trying to get some insight into how they're made and and certainly how they're they're funded and and pre-production and all of it. So um if you, before we talk about the vast of night, um I would like to kind of just get an overview of like what is Abacu? Why are you you know making it? Why are you passionate about it? What is the story that you're that you need to tell with this picture? Oh, man. Well, um, let's see. I'll just give the synopsis first to kind of bounce off of. But basically, it tells a story. It's a sci-fi uh, dramatic narrative piece, uh, a little bit of a genre bender. Um, and so it takes place in Abiquiu, New Mexico, which is a small rural town in New Mexico that is known for um, its paranormal history, um, it's beautiful topography and mountain ranges. And so the story is a mysterious uh, young boy um, wanders into this rural trailer park and gets taken in by that community there. But um, nobody knows where he's from. He's got these mysterious abilities um, there is a group of federal agents tracking him down. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of the start of it. Um, and the adventure with the neighborhood kids and the other adults and um, how they kind of grapple with um, breaking the law in some cases. So there's, there's a lot going on there. And what... In I don't know, should I dive into what inspired it or any questions about that part? Well, I just, <clears throat> the way you're describing, I mean, the last time we talked, we talked about uh, Mercy's Girl, which is, you know, you wrote and directed and starred in that. This sounds like a completely, I mean, it's obviously a very different type of movie, but just the ambition, the scope of it is is leaps and bounds beyond what you were doing with that, what's, you know, a very small and kind of grounded in in reality film what uh why the leap how how did you um i guess build up the the stamina the courage the the artistic drive to make this your second feature yeah that i i'm breaking all the rules in uh micro budget indie filmmaking with this one um <laughs> and i know why there are rules i mean typically you want to do one location you want to keep it in a genre that is um realistic to do to shoot um within that capacity of that smaller budget um so that's why a lot of indie films and micro budget indie films are shot in one location or with you know they pick like a, a rom-com or something like that uh, they don't work with children um 
Hmm. You know, they don't do anything in another state. I'm doing this all remotely. So yeah, it is very ambitious. It feels very ambitious. It feels very challenging, but I haven't made a film in about, I don't know, five years, six years. So for me, I, I'm prepared and ready and hungry to do it. And I have other scripts that I've been kind of playing with that I want to shoot here in Chicago, but I just kept thinking about some of the main characters. And I, I, you know, I see films like The Vast of Night, which obviously had a much bigger budget than I get to work with, but they were able to do a genre film in a simplistic way that didn't really require, you know, like CGI and special effects and all this other stuff. So it gave me hope that like, hey, if I can write a solid piece with some really, you know, thought out characters that the audience can connect to, but yet have this overarching mystery and this tension that builds. Um, and I love the desert. So that was a big chunk of it. It was like, I really want to shoot something out there. So Emily, th this was this was written by you, and when when uh, just uh, curious about your writing process, um, when when you're writing, um, do you are you the kind of person who you maybe have maybe one or two other people who you bounce ideas off of, or you want to see as you're writing like how things sound or how things are shaping? Just uh, you know maybe even as to have like a mentor or something to just you know, help you make sure you're on the, the, the right path and make sure everything's coalescing? Are, are you that type of writer or are you just totally solo? I, um, I'd say majority of it is solo, um, but there are people I check in with throughout the process. Um, and so one of them is pretty new to me and it's my producer, Aaron Wertheimer. We became friends. He's also a Chicago filmmaker. Sure. He helped produce Relative with yep. Michael. Yeah. And so um, we became friends. And so throughout, you know, after a first draft or two, I, I sent him and he, you know, gave me lots of notes on different things and I adjusted and, and he asked a lot of questions. And so it helped me fill in some areas that I didn't see, but, and then typically my sister who has three kids and is super busy, she was a filmmaker previously, um, was somebody that she still is the person that I'll send my script to. And then of course I have like a brother. It's a lot of family people. Okay. Usually send it to. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I didn't know your filmmaker, your, your sister was a filmmaker. Um, is she an older sister, younger sister? Like what's that? And did you both grow up wanting to be filmmakers? How did that, how did that all come about? Yeah, she's older. Um, and I kind of branched into it first. And then I got really passionate about it. And she was like, I, I've got this story. And she's always kind of uh, been a writer and, but didn't really see herself being a director as well or a producer. Um, and she's only made one film, but she's written a lot and she's been um, consistently like a judge for different writing showcases and stuff like that. So she's an amazing writer. That's why, hence I sent her my script a lot. Um, but uh, we didn't grow up, I didn't grow up thinking about filmmaking. I thought I was going to either be like uh, <laughs> a singer, which I, I have the worst voice ever. So I don't know why I thought that, but, um, <laughs> but I didn't think about filmmaking at all. And I think my sister was going to be a professional basketball player. So she didn't think about it. So it came later. Wow. later. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> There's there's a movie in there somewhere. I um, know, right? <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, I I I feel like we're we're out of it or we're you know leaving it in the past. So I almost hesitate to bring it up. But the P word, the pandemic. Mm. Um, <laughs> did any of that have an effect on Abiquiu in terms of you know you talked about you haven't directed a movie in six years? Was there anything about being kind of like locked down like we all were that kind of fed that that desire to like once you're out of this we're all kind of out of this cage you you, you know let me at it i gotta I gotta go make a movie was that part of it or is it just you know this was just the time and it's just it took six years to to figure it all out yeah i think it was partly because of the pandemic definitely um 
I think it slowed a lot of things down and, you know, it was about two years. I wasn't, I wasn't one of those people that was creative during that time, unfortunately. You know, a lot of people were like, oh, I wrote three scripts and I made this <laughs> podcast and web series and all these other things. I wasn't that way. I made bread. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we couldn't find yeast and jewel for like a year. No. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, but um, no, I think it was just like, I don't, I'm, I'm going to be, and I know I will be one of those filmmakers that makes one every probably four to five years, um, just generally, because it takes a lot out of you. I mean, that was the thing with the first one, Mercy's Girl, and then all my friends that are filmmakers, it's like, I know how much it takes. It really is more than a full-time job on top of whatever else you do for your living. Um, and it's, it's, anxiety ridden process and then you make the film and you forget it all so forget the whole the whole trouble of trying to make it but i'm curious about this with this next project um i have so many questions about you know going to a different state and making a movie but while you're talking just now i was thinking are, are you have you considered um filming what you're filming while you're there that's a good idea you know, uh, just just not not for like you know special features on a blue or anything, but I think it'd be very interesting interesting to see how this process goes. And obviously, you could be selective on on how you approach that and everything. But it, I mean, it sounds fascinating to me that you could almost have, you know, if you could afford, you know, <laughs> another, you know, like a second unit or whatever. I don't know, but but somebody else that's kind of there, um, filming it, and because I, I think there could be some very interesting things happening there while you're making the movie. Yeah. I've thought about that actually uh, about a month and a half ago, I started trying to set up my camera for the process of what it's like to be in pre-production. And then I just got so bogged down with pre-production that I was just forgetting to, but I have like a lot of footage beforehand of, you know, just the frustrations you feel and, um, you get, you know, you have these, and you have uh, meetings with investors that are really interesting and what that's like. And so I recorded all of that, those interactions because I was okay. like, I'll make a documentary maybe. But um, yes, I think it would be really interesting to show that stuff that, uh, when we're actually shooting as well. Right. But I think it's, it's hard to find that in the actual budget. Um, so a lot of indie and low budget filmmakers will have somebody come out for a day come out for, you know, but, and it's mostly for like promotional stuff, but right. Yeah. yeah. It'd be really cool. If somebody could do that. Yeah. I mean, well, even if it's shot on the iPhone or something, you know, well, right. I think, I think what David's trying to say is he's got enough sick days <laughs> that he could, he could make the trip. That's right. Uh, he'll buy his own ticket and hey, um, yep. we got a couch for you, you know, I'll, you know, it's, couch. it's New Mexico. I'll have a tent and you know, I'll get like a, you know, a whole setup. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um th yeah i i do want to come back to to talking about that because like the whole idea of pre-production and investors i mean i feel like we could do like an entire series on this which might even defeat the purpose of what you're talking about as far as you know capturing all this for a documentary but it is fascinating um <clears throat> but i would like to get into uh the vast of night for a little bit because that is one of the films that inspired um abiq mm -hmm. um it came out in uh, ooh, I, 20, 2019, I, 2019. Mm -hmm. and it was an Amazon, I guess, well, I watched it on Amazon. I think it's an Amazon production. Yeah. Uh, and I had heard about it. I had never watched it. I heard a lot of people talking about it uh, in reference to the twilight zone. Um, and, and having now watched it this morning uh, again at 4am, that's what I do. <laughs> uh, I can definitely see why. In fact, I'm, I'm oddly, I mean, I don't know if there was a rights issue or whatever, but the the opening narration with that Rod Serling esque voice over the very Twilight Zone Outer Limits intro to this kind of fake fifties TV show, I was like, "Wow, that's uh, that's right up to the line." Um, but tell me about like we'll talk about the movie itself, but what was it about this particular film? Because there have been a lot of you know alien. Uh, arrival, alien invasion, alien abduction kind of films. What grabbed you about The Vast of Night? I think that it was so different than what I had seen for a lot of tropes that sci-fi is, 
usually go go down right and 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 so I think it was like I said up earlier it just really surprised me that you could have a film in this genre and not have a bunch of CGI and not blow your budget on you know post production and stuff so I think that's what drew me to it and then I absolutely uh, there's so many elements I love but I really love long tracking shots mm -hmm. <laughs> I am a sucker for long tracking shots <laughs> because they're just they immerse the audience you just get lost in them there's no cuts and you're really there with those characters so that was the cinematography really inspired me and then the music and I'm not one for a lot of music in film I actually would prefer less music in most films but the music added so much suspense that wasn't necessarily had to be there visually. So it was just a lot of different elements to it that it was like, okay, so we, I can do something in this genre and I can do it smartly, you know? Very cool. Yeah. I, I think the music in this movie is interesting because a lot of his, uh, I think the word is didactic where it's, Di you know, diegetic. Obviously, there you go. So thank you. That's why I'm a co-host. Um, uh, because obviously the one of the characters is a, is a DJ um, and also the opening comes into the, you know, the small towns gymnasium where the basketball. And so you have that kind of, you know, the band music from the gymnasium that's rehearsing and all that. And so I, I think like, you know, this, the, the music in itself is kind of sparse because it's, you know, it's happening during the vast of night, but you know, there, there is still this, you know, there is a composer and everything here. So there is this buildup, but I, I think this movie's what's striking about this movie is it's more about the sound of the environment, you know, obviously the sound of what they hear uh, and what everybody's hearing from the sky, but also just um, movement cars, uh, the tape recorder thing, you know, all the, all these things. I think that that's, um, very integral to this this feature um yeah i like i guess we should probably synopsize the film for those who haven't seen it um again it's the uh, is it cayuga is the the name of the town mm -hmm. um it's a small town there's a big basketball game going on you've got uh everett sloan played by jake horwitz who's the local dj is is um David mentioned, and he kind of meets up with uh, with Faye Crocker, who's I I think they're both are they both supposed to be in high school or she's in high school and he's a little bit older. I kind of I, I couldn't quite. There's so think, much talking in this movie that I <laughs> like a lot of it washed right over me. I feel like he's a little older. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he's you know he's got this uh, this equipment and he's kind of showing her the equipment and they're going all around the town and. Um, they end up back at the the radio station and they get a very mysterious uh, call uh, from someone who claims to know a lot about the mysterious sights and sounds that are happening uh, all around the town. Um, they get another call from a lady who claims to have even more information. So they walk to her house um, and eventually they come face to face. We'll just talk spoilers, I guess, but uh, with the thing that is uh, that's. I was going to say terrorizing, but uh, confusing, confounding a lot of people in the town. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to say I didn't like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I I knew it. I knew it. I'm like, I, I thought, what if we talk about this movie and Ian wouldn't like it? So whatever. Here's the thing. <laughs> I think it is an anecdote wrapped up in a technical exercise masquerading as a narrative feature because at the end of this hour and a half which i i agree i they did not spend a lot of money on special effects although the the i think they're not obvious special effects you know there's not like laser beams shooting out and you know <laughs> monsters crawling out of people or anything like that but all the stuff with the you know the constant like uh, the camera kind of morphs in and out of the television set. Um, there's some really cool uh, ships, you know, they're, they're what I like to call unobtrus unobtrusive uh, special effects. It was like, oh, that's something that I feel like I could see, you know, just walking outside my house if things went really sideways. Um, but they, I think they spent a lot of their budget on wardrobe, on props i mean like i honestly felt like i was in this small <laughs> town on the outskirts of of nowhere in the early 1950s i mean 
I I would just love to have Faye's switchboard in my house and I would pay her to just like switch the things like for <laughs> two hours a day. Cause yeah, I talk about the sounds. I love the, the, pl the, the mechanical plugging in and stuff and all that. It's, it's great in that aspect. But when the movie was over, I'm like, okay, so it's a small town. People are seeing things and hearing things in the sky. Uh, two people kind of get a clue as to what's happening and then they get abducted by aliens. <laughs> Right. I, I mean, I'll yeah, be honest. That's I, I, I'm not, <laughs> I, I understand your take on it. I think it's, I'm, I'm a little more on Emily's side because I think it's just a little bit more distinctive than a lot of genre uh, films of that genre that we see. Um, I, I think it totally helps, completely helps that it's in the fifties. Um, very much so. I mean, if this was in 2022 or something, every, you know, all the kids would be in their phones and talking hmm. to each other. You wouldn't have to like zoom over to somebody's house. They, you would just FaceTime somebody or let me give you a Zoom link so we can talk, you know, all this stuff, you know. So that helps um, because it's it's more of a a mystery, more of a journey. And, and um, the you know, the way the director... Andrew Patterson approaches this movie with the long takes definitely helps to give the viewer an immersive experience. You are following everything. Sometimes long takes can be too long and they become, they can pull you out of the experience because then you're thinking, well, I'm really following this person for a long time. What's going on? You know? Um, and then sometimes if you're really aware of long takes, you start to think, okay, there was the edit. Okay. There was the next cut. And yeah. those long, long takes are tricky because you want it to be seamless and you want it to be purposeful and you don't want it to just be like, I love long takes, so I'm going to do this. You know, it, it you know it has to be um, for some type of reason. And in the end with this movie, although I liked it, I felt like I liked what it was doing, but what exactly was it saying about people or this kind of experience I don't know. Like even from what you described of Abiq, I feel like just from what you're describing, I feel like there's something to be gleaned from a, a trailer park society taking in this kid and how that affects the kid, the people, and it could say something about human nature. Boom, I'm in. Yeah. But with this, I was like, yeah, okay. You know, if this were the 1990s, I would expect uh, Mulder and Scully to show up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I agree I think for me there was the missing of like a substance to the characters too like I didn't really root for either of the characters I didn't care what happened at the end that they got taken any of that I was just kind of like this is an interesting way to, to do a sci-fi movie right but now. I agree about the long takes that's true I mean I'm just thinking about when I watched it I remember kind of uh separating from what i was watching because i was like wow this is a long take when are they gonna end it <laughs> right i you know and my i was not immersed in it i was very much conscious of it here's and this is why i call it a great technical exercise i feel like there's an art to what we're kind of talking about here having a long take where you're almost you feel like you're floating you know inside the story of the movie instead of watching a movie and I was just very conscious of, I'm like, okay, this isn't, there's not a track here. This is likely a camera mounted to a drone because it's going low and then high. And it's weaving in and out of the stands of the basketball game. It's kind of like, and I don't want to take away from the uh, artistry of the people who put these things together, but it sort of reminds me of when people talk about CG, CGI. Mm -hmm. um, they talk about, well, it's not like the practical effects back in the 80s, like you're just pushing some buttons on a computer. That's It's not as simple as that by a long stretch. But when I'm watching The Vast of Night, I'm thinking, well, they mounted a camera to a drone and the drone operator was very skilled in terms. And and also, I was also thinking about uh, the the people in the shot, the extras in the crowd as it's making its way through the gym doors, like passing through people, yeah. going around the court and then up into the stands. I'm thinking the people who were being filmed needed to subtly be able to shift. So it didn't look like they were getting out of the way of something. It looked like, you know, the the omniscient, uh, you know, the, the viewers is like yeah, hovering through the space. So, yeah, there it's technically great. 
Um, but I was very conscious of the fact that I was watching a movie being made. And as far as the 1950s thing, there are a couple of details that, you know, I feel that they, they took me right out of the movie. I paused and I did some like Wikipedia searching because I'm like, <laughs> I got a splinter in my brain. I'm like, that's not right. When Everett is on the phone with this mysterious caller, um, he's talking, this guy is talking about how he was in the military and he was called upon to do these, uh, you know, weird chores for the government and it made him sick. And he, you know, couldn't tell his story and because no one would believe him. And Everett says, why not? And he says, well, because I'm black. I'm like, that is not a word from the 1950s. You know, you know, the it was not in the con the national consciousness the way it was post civil rights movement. It was, you know, pardon it, pardon my language, but, you know, Negro or colored. Um, that was, you know, the way that people referred to themselves from that community back then. And sure enough, I, I went, I looked it up. Um, and then also. Faye later she's getting into a kind of a a squabble with people that she and Everett encounter in the town right before they get into a car and she's kind of I don't know if it was off the cuff kind of argument arguing and not completely scripted but she said like one or two times and like mm -hmm. that's a that's a modern affect as well and you know it's kind of it's, low, it's both points are low-hanging fruit but I feel like if you're trying to create something that is of a time and a place it's not just about you know hey we got these cool chrome microphones for the dj booth and an authentic switchboard it's also the <laughs> language you're right it is yeah definitely a language of the time you know i'm i think about like you know for example like american graffiti something like that where you're hanging out with these these kids um in the waning days of summer and you just feel like you're almost like picking up another language you know because it's late 60s or you know and so yeah i mean sure the writers uh james montague and craig sanger they they could have maybe you know studied up in the language maybe a little bit more sure or of the time um i you know i i feel like it would have been interesting to see if like like if, if we could get an idea of how many listeners are listening to his show because if there were people like you would expect to have like a bunch of people saying yeah i've seen that thing up in the sky you know <laughs> and uh yeah it came by last week in my uh my cousin eddie's uh farm and he swore he saw something that could have been lasers i don't you know okay thank you click you know <laughs> and, and it's just you you think it's like okay please call because you're gonna get uh, well, some some of Elvis's carpet, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and so you'd think there'd be a lot of people calling based on that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that because you think like in a small town like that too, most people were there at the basketball game, right? Mm -hmm. And even that old lady shared later that, well, the the aliens are are, are coming uh, at, are on this night because most people are going to be at the basketball game and they could pick up random people and they won't go missing right so I, I think it would have been interesting to see like okay if most townspeople are at the basketball game then who are the people who are like sitting at home listening to this you know because it's either radio or you know I, I guess there could be you know yes, early coming, television early television sure but it's either with a bass small town on a basketball game most people are there or sitting home like that old woman listening to the radio or mumbling her own language apparently um yeah yeah that, that was kind of another point and i i the the problem is i don't often get okay i'm always this nitpicky in my brain but i don't <laughs> there's like several layers before it seeps out into my actual spoken thoughts about a movie if i'm talking like this it's because a movie didn't grab me although yeah and Emily, I, I hope I'm not trashing it too much, but I was thinking about you while I was watching this. I was like, this... <laughs> Emily! No, 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 no. no. In, in a good way. I'm thinking there's something here, but I feel like it's something that somebody could pick up the ball and be inspired by this and make something that I would actually enjoy <laughs> watching. Um, I could definitely see how it people could watch this and be you know inspired to do something creative on their own, especially given... You know, this wasn't a giant, you know, Hollywood blockbuster. There wasn't, you know, a thousand theaters. It was a relatively, I don't know what the budget was for this. Do, do either of you know? Uh, yes, 700,000. Really? 
Yeah. I how much of that was spent on on like props and sets and wardrobe because I that it's so yeah I don't know maybe it's, I, I, maybe that stuff is really easy to come by in some places but it it didn't seem like it I did read up that they had to do a lot of work on the gymnasium for some reason like they they scrubbed down the whole uh, floor of the gymnasium to get rid of the three point line I'm not sure did they now have three points back in the, the three point line back in the 50s I don't well, know Well, I'm glad they did because uh, I was watching that floor for the three point line <laughs> I was like you better not no yeah <laughs> I don't know yeah, yeah I don't I don't know and they, they shot it in 17 days um you know which obviously maybe maybe that's why there were so many long takes let's get this done all right nice long take take care yeah, of it. And and I I dug the performances. I I yeah. hadn't I wasn't familiar with these actors before, and I kind of liked these characters. And I think that was, you know, the it felt like an hour and a half long pilot for a TV show that we'd never watched. David, you kind of mentioned the X Files. I mean, I'd like to see like what are what would Everett and Faye do on a UFO? <laughs> like, <laughs> right, they'd be right. skulking around with their tape recorder, like you know, in their kind of rat a tat dialogue, trying to figure things out. I mean, that that'd be great. But as it stands, they were just abducted and we're left to wonder if the old lady's story and her hypothesis which i thought was a little bit wackadoo about what these aliens are she's like they're the reason people fight and are jealous and have wars and like uh, we were Al pretty, alcoholism we were pretty, right, right. I mean, like we we're pretty good at messing ourselves up before yeah, we don't you know, need your help right <laughs> Wait, it's this, worse. No. <laughs> uh, do you, do you guys think there's a certain nostalgia to this movie too that uh, invokes a viewer, you know, of, of their own maybe certain nostalgia either of movies that we've watched in our childhood like this, like even like War of the Worlds or something like that or um old Twilight Zone episodes or even just conjuring certain nostalgia like for me in the beginning of the movie when Faye is, you know, she she's a little uh um she's a little trepidatious about showing Everett her tape recorder because it's a new thing and she doesn't know how to use hey can you show me how to use this and I you know I it it made me remember of you know I mean that's how I used to make you know tape I would tape music off the radio right oh you yeah your tape recorder right next to the radio click b96 you know whatever you know and I, I just remember it the weirdest thing is hearing your own voice off of what you recorded Mm -hmm. And and even like interviewing people like that, that was a thing, you know, um, that that was such an this movie just kind of reminded you that, well, that was a new thing, you know, and that was and then it kind of prepped you for kind of it made you kind of lean in a little bit closer um, and pay attention to what was being recorded and why and how these two characters were figuring that out. And then it it kind of because I was already leaning in closer, it it had me uh, look and listen a little bit uh, sharper throughout the rest of the movie, like what I was hearing, because I was already in tune with, okay, that's interesting. So I don't know, for me, it, it did conjure a little bit of nostalgia, but it, it also, that helped me, uh, I got kind of like lean in a bit closer, I guess. Mm. Yeah. I loved how quiet the town was. That's the nostalgia that, that came out for me is like that nighttime, you know, techno lack of technology. Everybody's at the game and they're walking and that I go on a lot of night walks. Like I, I just love it when the city's asleep and I love it when nobody else is out and about and it's quiet. So that was the nostalgia that I don't know if that's nostalgia. That's just a preference, um, but a preference of walking at night when nobody else is there, but you're in a town with, that's usually populated. That's usually bustling with, with commotion. And then the contrast between the aliens technology and the technology of the 1950s, I thought was interesting that they're still using switchboards to make mm -hmm. calls and stuff. I, I loved all of all of those little contrasts too, but I don't know. Ian, did was any of it nostalgic for you in any way? It made me nostalgic for. Don't say a good movie. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> I won't say it. Okay. No, um, no. It, but you know, David, you mentioned War of the Worlds. You know, I was also thinking of Close Encounters. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. which is a movie that I am in the minority on. I I don't like that one either. <laughs> of course, but. <laughs> but that but that mostly comes down to um 
Richard Dreyfuss's uh, character and, and the decision oh, he makes at yeah, the end. Okay. As a father um, and all that. Yeah, I get yeah, it. Yeah, again, technically, it's a, it's a brilliant you know Spielberg film. But it, it did remind me of movies that I watched coming up, and I think that was sort of my problem. Like, if this is my first uh, movie of this kind, exploring, like, the 1950s and, and aliens and all that stuff, it might be my favorite movie because I think it captures a lot of the mystery and the kind of wonder of that where the classic films, I think, have an advantage is they go deeper into story and characterization and actually kind of lead somewhere. This, yeah, this is a, it's a great sketch. It's a great, again, technical exercise, but it's missing that, that heart and that, that kind of, I'm going to use the fancy French term raison d'etre uh, that you kind of hinted at Emily uh, earlier. Let me go yeah. that up. <laughs> or, re re reason to be. Yes. Oh, that's, no. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah, that that's what four years of French will get you. Um, but uh, and also random pop culture references. But any final thoughts on the vast of night? Because I want to get back to, to Abiquiu and, and of course. Yeah, I did appreciate that. Uh, we never saw aliens. Yes, we saw a ship. We saw, you know, uh, a hole in the trees and everything. And it's like because that's all we need. You know, I mean, leave it to your imagination. Um you know, I, I honestly, I don't even think we needed that kind of establishing shot of the mothership. Yeah. And a little, it, we, I don't even think we needed that. Um, it, it, you know, did, Emily, did you see Nope? No, I didn't. Okay. I As I was watching this, I, I too thought of Emily and I thought, I wonder if she's seen Nope. Uh, but <laughs> because, because there is something in the sky, obviously there. Um, and I would be curious to see what you think of how they tackled that uh that is another movie that ian wasn't a fan of so it may no might, i it, no, it, it, i have it, not seen nope I, oh that's right and that's one of the reasons why he didn't see it because he wasn't a big fan of jordan peele's other movies um, no that's not true either david <laughs> i loved i loved us okay but i you didn't did like not, get out all right all right, all right, all right yeah okay. let's get the record straight man okay sorry sorry <laughs> um but but i you know maybe that would be something uh you'd be interested in seeing just because that is also set on like a sparse, you know, kind of open area. But the interesting thing there is most of the time we're seeing um, daylight. This guy wants to come up. It's been bugging me. <laughs> He's most, most of the time we see uh, daylight uh, in Nope, whereas here it's all obviously in the title, Bast of Night. Um, so, yeah, it's I mean, honestly, I, I like Ian, you were just saying, I mean, I think this would be a good you know, gateway sci-fi for somebody. Yeah. You know, leading on to, you know, bigger and better things. Um, and that's not to take away from what they've done uh, with this film. It's just, it, it didn't kind of connect for me. Um, Emily, do you have any, any final thoughts on Vast of Night? I mean, just to piggyback off of what you just said, David, I, I think my big thing that I took away was just that you could do sci-fi without showing a lot. And I think it's so much more interesting, even in, in not in sci-fi, like just in suspense or anything else. What sure. you see is so much more gripping and and um, it sticks with you more than what you see, right? Mm -hmm. and so that was something that I really liked. I wish they didn't at the end show the mothership. I didn't think you needed that. I didn't think you needed to see the ships at all, to be honest. Yeah. But, um, in general, from a technical point of view, I thought it was really interesting. And then there's elements, just like any other filmmaker, you take elements from it and you're like, ah, okay, I can do this with that. So that was what I got mostly from it. Yeah. Cool. So, so when you are crafting Abiquiu, uh, in addition to, to kind of this film, were there other like stories or movies that you were kind of watching there that were in your consciousness as you're writing this or trying to visualize it? Were you sketching things out? Like how did the story come together enough to the point where you're like, okay, this is a film. This is something I can take to people and say, because you mentioned you met with investors, like how do you come up with your, your lookbook or your demo reel or whatever? Like, where does it all start? That's what I'm getting at. <clears throat> It all starts with the script, definitely. Um, and then you create this kind of pitch deck stuff, which just takes 
hours upon hours to create because you don't have the visuals, but you have to say, Hey, this is what is it, what I'm hoping it will be. Mm -hmm. so you have to, you have to really draw that inspiration. And it's hard when you create something because you're kind of a sponge and you don't always know where it comes from. Right. It just is, it could be just from within you. It could be what you've absorbed over how many years, you know, of life. So um, to try to convey that in a pitch deck and to get investment and say, you know, hey, we're worthwhile investing in and we believe in the story and you should too and all that. It goes against my grain because a lot of people are like, what is it going to do on the back end, right? That's what they want to know. What's right. your distribution plan? What festivals are you going to submit to? Blah, blah, blah. How much money do you think it's going to make? So that is against my grain just because I do this for a passion. It's I don't do it for you know my lively income and stuff. But I understand if somebody's investing money, they want to know that. Um, but those conversations are, are so awkward and um, and for indie filmmakers, they can be either very defeating or once in a while they can be really encouraging and you don't know what you're going to get because you'll show up to these meetings and you're very serious and you've put a lot of time and effort and they're just like oh yeah haven't read the script so tell me what's this film about that you want me to give money to and you're like okay you know nothing about this let me <laughs> and and you had given them the script in advance right yeah you give them the yeah. script in advance and then at the end of it, they're like, well, yeah, I'm not really looking to do any, you know, sci-fi films. I'm looking for more of this thing. And to be honest, I don't really have any money to give right now, but thanks for your time. <laughs> so why, why are we meeting then? <laughs> yeah, so you get, you get a lot of those. And, and then you get ones that want total control. Like I actually had a meeting with an investor today who shall not be named um, that really wanted final edit say um wanted to own 50 percent of the film the concept everything Jeez. um and was very controlling even though i already have you know most of the budget in place actually and I, but they wanted to come in and make it a bigger production by upping the budget and all this stuff and so you deal with that as well um so it's, it's better. I talked to some other filmmaker friends and they're like, man, I'm just going to stick with these micro budgets just because working with investors sometimes it's just, it's just a pain. So. Is the, well, two questions. One, um, how, how do you find this is kind of a general question, but how do you find these people? Like, how do you find investors and, and, you know, are you able to vet them or is it kind of like the luck of the draw? Like you mentioned, you've shown up and had some not so great experiences. I imagine you've had some decent experiences as well, but how does one go about finding investors? Is it just a Google search or is it like a network of like fellow filmmakers or like, oh, I know someone who knew someone who knew someone? They come in all sorts of ways. So like uh, for one investor that did end up investing in the film, he saw Mercy's Girl and really enjoyed it and really believed in, he could see that it was rough and and in and, and, and a lot of ways, but he loved the the character, the character development, the story and all of that. So he he was somebody that had seen it and was a fan and said, hey, when you make another one, I want to invest. So that that's how it can happen sometimes. And then uh, another time it could be a friend that has worked with an investor and has said, oh, it was kind of a mixed experience, but you can try to send your script to them. And so then you send your script. And those are the ones where you meet with them and they're like, haven't read your script. and and don't even have any money to give but you know for them they like to take meetings so i get at least a free lunch out of it <laughs> <laughs> so is you talked about your your fellow filmmakers who are you know they want to stick with with micro budget stuff because it mm -hmm. takes a lot of the pressure off and i imagine allows a certain amount of creative restrictions because you don't have the the fabulous budgets and all that stuff but also mm -hmm you know, something resembling complete creative control is your goal as a filmmaker. And you mentioned earlier that you're fine making movies every like four or five years or so, whatever strikes your passion, whatever you can put together is the hope that someday, you know, either this movie or maybe the next movie will be a hit to kind of maybe not have to worry about investment so much to, uh, or like, I guess, can you imagine yourself ever getting to a state where you kind of go Hollywood? <laughs> Um, having lived in Hollywood previously, I hope not, but, um, yes, I mean, I think it is nice. I think 
writing is such a release for me and filmmaking is such a release for me um, that I do it for that purpose. But of course, it would be so great to be at a point where you could get stuff greenlit, you know, for a little bit bigger of a budget. So, you know, typically most filmmakers I know work in the 50 to 75K range. And, you know, even hearing that film that we just, you know, The Vast of Night for 700,000, I'm like, oh man, I can make seven films for that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, and I was, I, I'm not, not, not that you say that I was, what, what would, would you know what to do with 700,000 for one film, considering you could make seven? I mean, <laughs> yes, I would make it a lot more comfortable. I'd have my choice of locations. Mm. I could have bigger actors. Um, okay. I could tell a, a larger story as far as yeah like locations and space and I can branch out in that way and have my choice of cameras and gear because like even right now I am fighting with which gear we can have mm. due to budget constraints and even though the story right. calls for some other type of gear it's like well we have to be creative and figure out how we can get that shot without that piece of gear so mm. mm -hmm. gotcha so, so in terms of that i mean you're starting you're filming in two months in new mexico um you've got you know budget you've got some investors um you've got a seed and spark campaign where you're trying to raise i guess i imagine trying to round things out uh for the production but uh, you know you've got this script you've got you know your deck you've got the investors how do you get to the point where you've cast people you you're high you've hired a crew you're negotiating equipment like what is that process like and how long does that take to to bring everything together i mean you're you mentioned this isn't your full-time job <laughs> yeah i work i work in government tech for my full-time job so um it is a lot of you know balancing a lot of nights like i close my work computer and i open up my personal computer you know six days a week i try to give myself one day off where i'm not doing you know either of those things but um but it is a lot. It's uh, right now I'm currently finishing up building the crew and some of the cast. I already have some of the cast, which is uh, the one Chicago actor that we are flying out because she's so phenomenal and who just recently signed with us is uh, Chaudrine Alvarez, who was in St. Francis. If you saw that one, that was another local indie filmmaker yeah. one. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, she's really well known for in the theater community. And I saw her in another film this fall um, at Midwest Film Fest, and she blew me away. Which one was that? Because I think I saw her pop up recently. Yeah, she was in a, a film called Heart Song. Okay. At Midwest Film Fest, and I was blown away by her performance. So I reached out to her and sent her the script and all that. So we just signed with her. And then now I'm currently still casting a uh, quite a few of the roles um, while I'm building out my crew. So it, it happens simultaneously. And we try, I mean, I'm hoping probably in the next two weeks, we have everything set as far as crew and cast goes. So that gives us a good month for everything else. So are you, are you crewing up and casting locally to New Mexico? Or, I mean, have you had to go out? I imagine you'd had to go out there to like scout locations and figure everything's going to be, you know, going to happen. But if you're crewing locally, is a lot of this stuff happening over like Zoom meetings and things? Or are you constantly traveling back and forth? And again, this is not what you do for a living. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, uh, it is a lot of Zoom calls. It is so many Zoom calls. In between <laughs> work phone calls, I'm taking Zoom production uh, calls. So it is back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Like I literally live in front of my computer right now. Um, <laughs> and yes, and everything is a... Um, an adjustment and a pivot. Everything is. It's hard. It's I just want to be in the creative mindset, but because you know you're an indie filmmaker, you have to play also the business and producer right. role as well. Um, so it is. Yeah, I'm crewing up locally. Everybody's going to be local, just because I can't house everybody. And same with the cast, except for the lead, Rosa. Uh, uh, Shireen plays the lead character, Rosa, in the film. So. Yeah, it's it's a balancing act of both. It was bugging me, so I had to check what uh, I was listening. But it was bugging me. I had to check what she was in, and it was rounding this yeah. movie that was at Chicago International Film Festival, which was quite interesting. Also directed by Alex Thompson, who directed St. Francis. 
Right. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah. So for this production, um, and I know you're still kind of going through it. So this might, this answer might change, you know, throughout the course of making the movie and, and even post-production and release and all that stuff. But what's been the biggest, I guess, professional and personal hurdle that you've gone through and also your biggest professional and personal triumph, your unexpected like joy that you found in this project so far? The hurdle has been um, just finding the right team so far. Cause you get people that are interested, but when it comes down to like actually make it, that's when they flake off. So mm -hmm. now that's been a hurdle, but now I'm at the point where I do have the right people and it makes a world of difference. You can just tell energetically how much they give, how much they're in this with you. Um, so I think that has been the hardest part. And then also just doing it remotely. It's incredibly hard. We found an amazing town that we're shooting in called Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. That is awesome. the name of the town. It is so, it's named after a radio show. Um, right. Yeah, it's such a cool town. All of our locations are there, including the trailer park. Imagine trying to find a rural trailer <laughs> park that will let you shoot in. Um, awesome. It's so hard to find. So that was really hard and such a hurdle. But um, yeah, and I think also just now even raising money is hard. It, it was luckily a big portion of this came from Mercy's Girl proceeds. So I had that saved for this for whatever film I was going to do next. But still, even now, a lot of people are tight on money. So we're, and with Seed and Spark, if you don't get 80%, you don't get anything. Mm. So there's a lot of pressure on that. But, you know, besides besides those things, um, the triumphs have been, honestly, just hearing the feedback on the script. I, because I put so much work into the characters and the, and the arc of the story to hear that I haven't shared a script in years. So to hear that people connected, especially with Rosa, the main character, um, really felt good. It felt it felt it reassuring and made me feel confident in the in making this movie. When you do that, is it, you know, initially kind of nerve wracking? Like, here's my script, you know, <laughs> you know, because you're putting it out there and it's always hard to know, like, if they're going to see what you see in it. You know, and I guess that's like you're saying one of the challenges of forming a crew like that. You know, are they going to be on board with your vision? And also, I'm sure, you know, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure you hope to, you know, glean something from your crew too. You know, and and bring, uh, you know, you're hoping that they're going to bring something that maybe you hadn't thought of too. That's that have this whole collaborative, you know, prog, pro, you know, the whole progress of it. Yeah, there's nothing better than when you give somebody a script and they're like, oh, yeah, and I see this and they build upon it, you know, awesome. then you know you're probably working with the right person. Other people cool. come back with just a, a ton of like, how can you make that? That is way too ambitious. <laughs> for <this budget. laughs> yeah, I guess that's a good indication of whether you want to work with that person. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. You know, we'll be creative. We'll we'll make it work. We'll pivot. We'll find things. We'll ask for favors. You know. Yeah, the same way everybody else makes a movie, I guess. You know, <laughs> of this <Yeah>. budget. <laughs> now with Seed and Spark, um, how did you select Seed and Spark? What was it about? I mean, because that that's a little nerve wracking there that you have to. It's eighty percent or broke. You know. Um. So then, I mean, obviously, there's other outlets. There's other fundraising outlets. I know a lot of people do use Seed and Spark. What? If if that's the con, then what's the pro of Seed and Sparks? I'm not sure, David, honestly. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> you I know, guess... I, I'm not a social media person. <clears throat> Even though I work in technology for my day job, I am not a tech person. Like I I just am not. I and so I just asked. I asked other people, hey, what did you use to raise right. you know crowdfunding? And they're like, do seed and spark. They're just they're amazing. Hmm. It's the best. And you know what? They have been really good. They expect more from you. Um, when you're creating your campaign and they're there alongside you to help you. But it is that caveat of, well, if you don't get 80%, then you get zero. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. sort of really hard, but um, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I think we have, you know, about two weeks left on the campaign and I think we can get to 80% of that 10 K. Um, I've, I'm I'm still out there pushing, even though I don't have much of a social media following, I have a lot of friends that do. So that's helping. 
there you go well and we're we're hoping to uh to help boost that a bit here this will be going up um probably tomorrow which means nothing for people who are watching this in the future but uh it'll be just about the just about the two week mark there you um, go I want to ask you about the the tears because they're they're Goonies <laughs> themed, which I love. Um, how did you how did you come up with that that idea for for the tears? Well, I am obsessed with the Goonies. I actually went to Astoria, Oregon to go. So see did them. I? Did you? Yeah. Yep. See where things were filmed. So those are like stories from my childhood and films from my childhood that I love. You know, um, I love all the characters and the adventure of it. And and so the character, some of the characters in the film are inspired by the Goonies characters. Like I have a character that is very similar to Mouth in, nice. in there that, you know, isn't, you know, for a complete copy, but it is similar. I, I just really love that character. And then the older brother, um, I forget his name, something, the Mike, older brother, yeah. yeah, he like is always lifting weights. Oh, Brand, like, <laughs> Brand, that's right. Yeah, yeah, Brand, yeah. What the female? There, there's an older sibling of the mm-hmm. younger sibling in there. In there, she's always lifting weights and smoking cigarettes in my script, and, and she's one of the neighborhood kids too that cause gets wrapped up in this adventure. It's basically these neighborhood kids get wrapped up in this crazy adventure, and there's all these adults on the on the perimeter besides the main character Rosa. Um, so that's what kind of why I decided to tie it into Goonies. So you're going to have to ask Cindy Lauper if she could do a song for your movie. And, <laughs> you know. It's good enough for me. That's right. Um, no, uh, two things then. Um, one, you mentioned you've got a character who's smoking. That's something that that struck me in the vast of night is Faye was like smoking a lot. You know, she's I don't know, 14 or 15 or whatever <laughs> she is. And I was like, you never see characters smoking anymore. Even it used to be like it was as it was kind of dying out in TV and movie. It was like, oh, we'll just have the bad guy or the, the villain smoking. Right. You know, right. Indicate like, oh, they're nefarious. But so you've got an actual character smoking cigarettes in your movie. That's that's bold. I, yeah. I'm not. This is not a criticism. I, I love it. I want to see more smoking on screen. <laughs> Not in, not in real life, kids. Don't smoke, but, you know, yeah. for the well, arts. I mean, I do enjoy a small little, what are those, a small little roller cigars every once in a while. Um, and I used to be a smoker back in the day. But I like uh, contradictions. And so the reason why she's smoking. Working is, out, yeah. Working out. And I wanted to have that there. So there's <laughs> lots of little character things like that where there's contradictions that don't, I don't want them to be one-sided. So it's like adding these extra elements to the characters. Well, yeah, that is always interesting. The other thing I wanted to say is, I, I don't know if, if you've tracked this at all. I don't know if it's a thing, but maybe, I know you're not social media savvy, but you know we're a week out, almost a week out from the Oscars. The third tier on here is the data tier. <laughs> yeah. he kwan just won the academy <laughs> award for everything everywhere all at once so you should really get on that and say hey this is our data plan <laughs> no sorry um i just didn't know if, if maybe you'd seen like a, a, a surgeons in in that tier after the uh oh yeah <laughs> after right oscars. after the oscars that tier went <laughs> rough sky, rough sky high that's all it's been all week it's really weird so that and i'm glad you pointed that out because i was wondering it was that it must be the correlation it must be <laughs> <laughs> well, Emily, I I can't thank you enough uh, on behalf of myself and David for for hanging out and talking with us about uh, AvaQ and also uh, the Vast of Night. Uh, I know when we had gotten to get, gotten together at the relative screening last summer, we talked about like, yeah, we should do a podcast together. And unfortunately, it's like six months later. Hey, we're talking. <laughs> yeah. um, and I know you're going to be really busy in the next couple of months, but you know, I I would love to have you back on for us to to talk about you know, ABIQ and also, you know, other movies, anything you want to talk about, because this has uh, been a lot of fun for us and hopefully for you, too. <laughs> it's been all right. I don't, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. I'm just yeah, I'll take yeah. it. I under I understand. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great. It's been great. I love I love talking with you, too, and being able to see you, even if it's six months apart. That's totally fine. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Exactly. Well, so. um the link to the Seed and Spark campaign for Abiquiu will be down in the description below. Uh, so everyone, please uh, support the film. Check out Mercy's Girl. Also, I'll leave a link to... Where is Mercy's Girl streaming? Is it, is on, it still it's on, on Prime? Other platforms? 
Yeah, it's on a, a variety of streaming platforms, but most popular is Amazon Prime. I'll leave a link to that too. So folks can, if you haven't watched Mercy's Girl, A, shame on you, but B, you can rectify that by checking it out below and then and then support uh, Emily's next picture. Um, yeah, congratulations on making it this far and for going to make a damn movie out in New Mexico in a couple months. That's that's incredible. It, you know, you're rolling your eyes and shaking your head, but it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. One day at a time. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully I'm on here in another six months and we're talking about it, reviewing it. That would be good. Yeah. It'd be amazing. <laughs> yes. Excellent. And I, I quote unquote promise I will have a higher opinion of it than the vast of night. At least that's why <laughs> <laughs> you will. You will. I mean, if your guest is the filmmaker, Ian, you better. <laughs> yes. Um, I'll let David handle that one. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, no, I'm I'm a big fan of yours, uh, you know, from from your acting to the, you know, the filmmaking. Um, I'm excited to see what you do in this. Again, I'm I'm mostly intrigued by the the ambition and the scale of what you're describing and the type of movie you're making evolving from uh Mercy's Girl. I'm I'm excited to see what a talent like you can do taking it up to the next level. So uh, yeah, all good things. I can't wait. For yeah. sure. You got our support. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. All right. Emily Lape, have a great evening and best of luck. We'll be in touch. Have a great night. All right. Scooter says goodbye. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>